Good morning. Well, a very, very warm welcome to all of you here today. What a glorious day God has given to us to gather in his house, to be together as the people of God, to glorify him, to worship him. We're just excited to be here today, and I hope you are as well. I know I am, and as you perhaps have had a chance to peek at your order of service today, we have something very special going on. We have a baptism today for little Lena, Jenna, and and Kurt's newest edition, and we are so excited about that. And we do want to welcome uh, any who have come for that today specifically. I know we've got some family here today, and uh, we'll get to more of that in a, in a little bit. Uh, but welcome to all of you and to each and every one. Well, we are gathered here today to worship God. That's where our hearts are today. We are here to worship. I want to read for us just a couple of verses from Psalm 95 as we enter into that time together. The psalmist says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let's make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. And how good that would be for God's people to enter into worship with thanksgiving, with songs of praise, with joy in their hearts. And we have so much to be joyful for. So would you please stand as the God whom we have gathered to worship wants to greet us, the God of our salvation. He greets us this morning with these words, grace, mercy, and peace be to you. From God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
you pray with me? God, how good it is to come into your presence today, to know that we come into this place not because of who we are, but because of who you are. And not because what we have done, but because of what you have done for us in Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah whom you have sent. To know that it is through his blood that we are washed white as snow. To know it's through his glorious resurrection that we enjoy victory over sin and even death. God, this is why we come into your presence with thanksgiving and why we sing with joy. So, Father, we pray that you would bless our service today, that in all the things that happen in the course of this service, that that thanksgiving and that joy might, might overwhelm, that, God, you would speak to us and that we would be ready to listen and then to go into this world to be the people you have qualified us to be and called us to be in Jesus. So we give this time to you, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We have the wonderful privilege together to witness the baptism of little Lena Grace Ritzema. And uh, it is my joy and pleasure to turn it over at this point to Kurt's dad, uh, Reverend John Ritzema. And this is a really special thing. And I think, John, you've uh, baptized all the kids, right? All right. And I know uh, my dad is a pastor as well, and he was involved with uh, the baptisms of his grandkids. And what a joy. And it's our, our privilege to welcome you, John. Thank you. I'm going to read and have an opportunity to fellowship with Kurt and Jen and the family this morning in terms of reading the, uh, the form for baptism. So we're going to let you just kind of eavesdrop and, and listen in as we, we read it and as we share this very special occasion. I'm as nervous as can be. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> I'm already stumbling over all my words. So what a rejoice, what an opportunity, and what a privilege. If you'd like to read along... I'm going to read the form for baptism from page 960. Page 960. In the middle of the second paragraph, under the heading of the instruction. Let us recall the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our sin by the blood of Christ and the renewal of our lives by the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. And from this we learn that our sin has been condemned by God and we are to hate it, consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, the water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. And from this we learn we are to walk with Christ in newness of life. And all this tells us that God has adopted us as his children. And now if we are his children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Thus in baptism, God seals the promises that he gave us when he made this covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust in life and faith in Christ our Savior to deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow in obedience and love. And the beautiful thing about all this is that God graciously includes our children in his covenant. And all his promises are for them just as well as us. Jesus himself embraced little children. And he blessed them. And the apostle Paul said that children of believers are holy. Children of the Old uh, Old Covenant receive the sign of circumcision. And our children receive the sign of baptism. We are therefore always to teach our little ones that they have been set apart from baptism as God's own children. Join me in a prayer. Father in heaven, we pray that you'll never destroy us in our sin as with a flood or save us as you saved believing Noah and his family and spare us as you spared the Israelites who walked safely through the sea. We pray that Christ who went down into the Jordan came up to receive the spirit who sank deep into death and was raised up the Lord of life will always keep us and our little ones in the grip of his hand. 
We pray, O Holy Father, that your spirit will separate us from sin and openly mark us with a faith that can stand the light of day and endure the dark of night. Prepare us now, O Lord, to respond with glad hope to the promises that you, that we and all entrusted to our care may drink deeply from the well of living water. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I invite you to join me in the front for your questions this morning. Kurt and Jenna, since you are now presenting Lena for baptism this morning, I ask you to answer the following questions before God and his people. First of all, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? And second, do you believe that your children, your child, though sinful by nature, are received by God in Christ as members of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized. And third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct Lena in the Christian faith and to lead her by your example to be Christ's disciple? What is your response? We do. God help us. And do you, the people of God, promise to receive this child in love and to pray for her, to help instruct her in the faith, and to encourage and sustain her in the fellowship of believers, what is your answer? We do. God us. This morning, the privilege and the honor that I have extends to um, not just today, but also the realization that the water of baptism this morning comes from the Jordan River in Israel. But I want you to know that there's nothing significant or powerful, more powerful about this water than any other water, other than what it means for Kurt and Jenna. When they embarked on their mission trip to Israel, they were already attempting to produce a child. And since this wasn't happening naturally, they presented their prayerful appeal to God that somehow they might be blessed with a child. And one of the themes of their trip was the challenge to go all in for the Lord. Remember that? Yeah. And there's no holding back. Totally commit yourself to his will. And they came under the conviction while there that God was telling them to go all in with regard to their desire to have a child. And as a result, Lena's here today as an answer to that prayer. So the water that came from the same source as the water that John the Baptist used to baptize Jesus is the water that we use today to baptize Lena. Lena Grace Ritzema, I baptize you in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I'm about to do a dangerous thing. And take a quiet baby from her, from her parents this morning. But Lena, we bless you today. You're a gift from God. And it's our prayer that your life might become a gift back to God. In the Bible, Hannah prayed for a, a child and the Lord blessed her with that child which he freely dedicated to the Lord. And it's our prayer that you will dedicate your life to the Lord. And just as Kurt and Jenna came under the conviction to go all in for the Lord, it is our prayer that one day you too will go all in for the Lord Jesus Christ. May God bless you. Let us share together. 
Lord our God, this is a moment in which we experience the total closeness and intimacy of being family. The realization that even though we may not be related to the Ritzma family by blood, we are related by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because we are related to one another in the blood of Jesus Christ, we rejoice with each other's joys and we share one another's burdens and we carry one another's sorrows, but we are also thrilled beyond all imagination when miracles of, gra of grace and blessing come our way. And we thank you this morning for the beautiful celebration a baptism that is ours. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to receive Lena Grace into the family of God and for your blessing upon her and your promise to be her God. And may we, Lord God, embrace and, and incorporate her and each and every one of the children in our lives and bless them accordingly. It is our prayer that you will richly bless them as they parent as Kurt and Jenna lead and instruct and guide and nurture and discipline with the love of Jesus Christ, that one day, too, they will stand in, a, in amazement but also in blessing for your grace in her life. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
Well, as God's people so inspired by him to want to praise, to want to respond in gratitude to all of his blessings, we have just been witness uh, in a very special way to God's grace. It is good and right for us to go to him and in prayer. Know that he hears, know that he listens, and know that he will respond. As we do that, I just want to take a moment and highlight a couple of things for us that all of us need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, in terms of an announcement, uh, just to know after the service today, following the fellowship time or during the fellowship time, if you want to make your way into the gathering place, there's going to be a ministry showcase there, and you can learn all about the various ministries and activities and things that go on around here. Perhaps you'll come to know some things you really didn't even know were happening or maybe find a place to sign up and participate or, or to volunteer. So make sure that you uh, go to that gathering place right behind the narthex uh, immediately after the service or after that, that fellowship and coffee time too. Then if you would uh, please be keeping in your, your thoughts and your prayers uh, through the week to come, a couple of prayer concerns. Uh, Hazel Slaw continues to be in the hospital receiving hospice care, uh, so please pray for her and the family. Uh, pray for the Scrotenbores and the loss of uh, Jean's sister Rachel as well, uh, just for, uh, for peace and for comfort. And uh, again, just to know that as God's people, uh, together we go to him. And let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this glorious day that you have given to us. So grateful for the, the beauty of the sunrise today, for how comfortable the temperatures are. And Father, just to know that you are God over all. And to know that as we wake up in this day, that it is you who have provided breath for our lungs. You have given energy to our body. You have given a, a, a willingness to our spirit, Lord, to be here in your house today. And we are so glad for that. Our hearts truly are full of gratitude and full of joy as we come here acknowledging you as the one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the God who is the author of our salvation, the one who is the finisher of our faith. God, we are so glad to be in your house today. Father, we are so glad as well that we could witness together just a moment ago your grace in action in this baptism of little Lena. Father, we're so glad to hear all of the promises that you have given to Lena, so glad to witness together Kurt and Jenna's response and to make our promise as your people as well. Father, what a blessing it is to be part of the family of God. And again, we are so thankful for that. Father, even as we just sang a moment ago in response to that, uh, in response to that grace, in response to that baptism, that you would truly take our lives. And Father, as much as we want that to be the case for Lena, we want that to be the case for each and every one of us here today. That, Father, you would take all that we are, that you would take our hands, our feet, our minds, our will, our hearts, and everything about us, that you would lean it into your will. 
That, Father, we would truly become more and more the people that you are calling us to be. That's what we want, and we pray by your Spirit you would enable that to happen. Father, we are so grateful for all of your goodness to us. Father, you work in our lives, each one of us as individuals and as a family and as a church family, in marvelous and wonderful and sometimes surprising ways, and we are so grateful for it. Father, help us to see that everything that we have is from you. Father, help us to be good stewards of all that you have given to us, whether that's our time or our talents or even the treasures that you have blessed us with. Father, we pray again to be good stewards, faithful stewards of all that we have for your name's honor and glory and to the furtherance of your kingdom. Father, we want to say a special prayer today for Nate and Vicki as they look toward this Friday and the wedding that they have been planning for so long. We ask a special blessing on them. And Father, we pray not only that, that the ceremony itself is beautiful, but we pray for their marriage. And Father, we ask a special blessing upon it. Father, we know that there are people in our midst here, in this family of God here at Grafscop that are struggling today. And Father, they need our prayers, and we want to pray for them. We pray for Hazel. Father, we know that she's in the hospital. She's been there for many days already. She's receiving hospice care. And Father, we recognize that from our earthbound perspective, it seems as though her time among us is short. And so we pray for her. Continue to give peace to her heart. Be with her family too. And Father, may they know your great mercy at this time. Father, we pray, too, for all of those who've recently lost loved ones, certainly the Scrotenbor family and the loss of Jean's sister, Rachel, but others, too, who've recently suffered that loss. Father, continue to give a peace that passes understanding. And for all of those of our church family recovering from various surgeries and procedures, Father, as they recover, as they rehab, we pray for that to go well for them. Father, for so many other needs and concerns that we have, much of which are, are private, Father, we pray for that. Uh, whether they are struggles with family or struggles at work or even struggles in our faith, Father, for all of these things, we look to you and we trust that you will provide everything that we stand in need of. Father, continue to be with our, our students, both young and older, who are heading back to school. Some have gone already. Some look forward to that this week. We pray for that to go well for them. We pray for our church programs that are starting soon. And Father, even as we have a ministry fair this morning, and we're very grateful for all of the things that we can do and engage in as a church. And Father, we pray for all of these programs that will start we think of children's worship. We think of Sunday school. Father, we pray for Deb as she oversees that and for Kurt as he oversees the youth ministry starting soon and all of the Bible studies and things like that that will happen. Father, we pray for that. And Father, we pray for all of our, our committees and our council. For those who give leadership, we ask a special blessing on them. Father, we pray for our nation today. We pray for our president we pray for our world and we pray for all of those who am, you have set in positions of leadership. Father, we pray that through them and that your will would be done, that your kingdom would continue to come, that, Father, as your people, we would be ready and responsive to the call you have on us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And as far as that is around the world, it's as close as our next-door neighbor and Father, we pray that we would be ready to do that for your name's honor and glory. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity of worship. We pray a blessing on it. And Father, we ask again that you would make us, uh, our hearts, open and ready. And that once again, we would go into this world, into the weeks that you have prepared for each one of us, wanting and desiring and, and, and doing such that will bring you glory and lift up the name of Jesus. It's in his precious name we pray, in the power of the Spirit. Amen. The offering this morning is for uh, the Christian Education Opportunity Fund right here at Grafscop. So let's worship God together as we give of those gifts.
friends, would you rise if you're able to worship? Well, congregation, this morning we are continuing in a sermon series, a new sermon series that we began just last Sunday morning. If you were here, you recognize the screen. If not, it might be new to you. It's called a Famous 316s. That is a chapter and verse reference. So what we're doing is we're just kind of uh, taking a look at some famous 316s uh, in the Bible as we find them there. And of course, uh, last Sunday we began by taking a look at the most famous 316 of all. That was John 316. I think we're very familiar with that text. And uh, we kind of entered into that text by asking a question. And that question was, what is your idea of God? 
In other words, how do you understand God? If someone off the street just asked you this question, how would you respond? We said, down through the centuries, many people have had different ideas of God that they've put forward to. And you know, we said, maybe some people see God as a, as a clockmaker, right? Someone who created this world, but then just kind of step back. He's kind of hands off it. He doesn't have really anything to do. Other people we said, kind of see God as this Santa Claus figure, just this jolly old guy, maybe with a big white beard, and he rewards good little boys and girls. Some people see God as a, as a policeman, right? Someone to really be scared of. He's always out to get us. In John 3, we highlighted the fact that Nicodemus uh, saw God as only a God for those who were worthy, right? We dug into that a little bit more. But the fact is, we said, as we looked at John 3, 16 and the surrounding verses there in John chapter 3, that God is a lover, right? God is a God of love. There is this deep and this passionate and this intense love for us. In fact, so much, he loved us so much, Jesus tells us in John 3, 16, that he would send his only son to die for our sins, so that absolutely anyone who believes in him, who looks to him in faith, would be able to know salvation and eternal life. So that's where we began. Well, this morning, we want to ask another important question. And that question is simply this, what is your idea of Scripture? In other words, how do you understand the Bible. I mean, is the Bible just, a, just a, an interesting book, and it's full of interesting stories, and it's got a lot of interesting characters? You know, maybe it falls somewhere along the line of Melville's Moby Dick or even J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter, or is there more to the Bible? Well, Paul, the Apostle Paul, in the midst of chapter 3 in his second letter to Timothy, gives us really a clear answer to that question. And obviously, we're going to focus our thoughts on verse 16, but we're going to read the entire chapter. We've got to give it some context as well that's also very important. So I'm going to read the whole chapter of chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And if you want to follow along with me, uh, you'll find it on page 1182 of your pew Bibles. Page 1182, here's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Here Paul writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jembres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. You, however have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured. Yet for all of them, from all of them, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith in Christ Jesus, all scripture is God breathed, breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's as far as we want to read in God's word this morning, and may he bless his word to us today. Now, as I'm sure you sensed as I read through that chapter, and I think that it's safe to say that for many of us, this is a familiar chapter. We've heard these words before, but as I read through it, you think, wow, there's, there's an awful lot that Paul sticks into this, this chapter here. And the fact of the matter is, any verse or variety of verses we could kind of pull out and we could use as the basis for a sermon. But we want to focus our attention particularly on verse 16 because there Paul says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. But right before we really dig into that, I think there's a couple things just in general, some initial information we just need to know. So a couple of things. First of all, I think we need to recognize here that this particular letter to Timothy, the second letter that, that Paul writes to Timothy, who was a dear friend and partner in the gospel to him, this is, as far as we know, the last letter that the Apostle Paul ever wrote most likely before he, was, before he was killed at the hands of the Romans. So as far as we know, again, maybe there were others, but we don't have them, we don't know about them. As far as we know, this is the last letter. And in that respect, I want to point out that it's really significant that Paul uses some of his last words, some of his final thoughts to talk about Scripture and that tells us immediately that for Paul, Scripture was no mere interesting story with interesting characters and, and interesting happenings, but it was far more than that. And then secondly, I think just in all fairness, we need to understand that when Paul in our text uses that word Scripture, that initially for him, he was referring to what we are aware of as the Old Testament, right? That was the scriptures that Paul would be thinking about. And maybe, maybe a couple of gospels, maybe a couple of New Testament letters that had begun circulating around. Maybe that too was in his mind. However, I think we also need to understand by something called retroactive inclusion, now, we've all learned a new term today, right? Retroactive inclusion. That term, that term understands that now, and theologians will say this, that now what, when we understand it that way, all of the Bible, when Paul uses the word Scripture, now all of it, as we know it today, Old Testament and New Testament is included in that. So I think we just need to, we need to understand that we'd have that kind of baseline initial information. So that said, then let's turn our attention specifically to 2 Timothy 3.16. We want to consider a couple of things. You'll see them on your outlines if you have them out. Namely, we want to talk about the nature of Scripture and also the tasks of Scripture because that's what Paul is telling us about here. So let's start with the nature of Scripture. Paul puts it this way at the beginning of verse 16. He says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. If you, like me, have the NIV stamped in your mind, uh, it's more along the lines of all Scripture is God-breathed. But whichever way we want to translate that, what we have to understand is that the baseline, the, the initial word that Paul uses here in the original language means inspired by God. Inspired by God. And that is a phrase that tells us very, very clearly that God himself was intimately involved in the writing of Scripture. God himself was intimately involved in the writing of Scripture. Now, the next question is, and perhaps you're already asking this, is, well, what did that involvement look like? What did that involvement look like? And here there are basically three modes of thinking, and I want to quickly share them with us. The first view on this, the first way of thinking about this, 
is called the dictation theory of inspiration. So the dictation theory states that God basically whispered the words of Scripture to the human authors of Scripture, and they wrote down exactly what God said, word for word for word. Kind of like a, a, in today a, a court stenographer, right? So a recorder in the courtroom, they're feverishly typing down absolutely word for word everything that the judge says, everything that the lawyers say, everything that, the, uh, that those on the stand say, right? So they have a, uh, just a 100% record of that. So this is the dictation theory. And if we're, if we're drawing a continuum here from your right to your left, this is way over here on the right and it's typically referred to, generally referred to as the fundamentalist view of inspiration. Okay, that's the dictation theory. On the other end of the spectrum, way over here, it's called the dynamic view of inspiration. So now this view says that the authors of Scripture, the human authors, basically had free reign. They could say anything they wanted to say. They could write down anything they wanted to write down, any, any how they wanted to write it. They could intersperse their own interpretation in this. So very much, we might say, like a, like a contemporary novelist. And so this is often referred to as the liberalist view of inspiration, way over here on the left. The third possibility is called organic. And this is the view that God, by His Spirit, moved the authors of Scripture to write what they did, but He did so using the author's own personalities and characteristics. So much so that if we had two manuscripts, biblical manuscripts, side by side, two books of the Bible side by side, and we didn't know who the author was, but we knew a lot about the various authors of Scripture, we could read those and say, you know what? That sounds like Paul. Or that sounds like Peter. Or that sounds like Dr. Luke. Oh, no, no, that sounds like Matthew. And this is usually understood to be the Reformed view of inspiration. So when Paul in our text says all Scripture is breathed out by God, we in the Reformed community understand that to mean that the Bible, even though it was written down by human beings, it was done so as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And that's an image, that's a phrase that comes right out of Scripture too. Peter talks about this in chapter 1, verse 21. He says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And obviously this tells us then that the Bible is much more than a Melville novel it is much more than a, than a rowling adventure tale. So it tells us that as God's word, the Bible has divine authority. In other words, in the Bible, what we have is God speaking to us. And as such, you and I, we need to pay attention. We need to pay attention. Now from that point, still in 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul then goes on to tell us about the tasks of Scripture. It says all Scripture is breathed out by God. So the Bible has this divine authority. And therefore, says Paul, it's profitable, it is useful for teaching for reproof or rebuke, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. So Paul is highlighting for us here the three primary tasks of Scripture. The very first one, he says, is that Scripture founds our faith. Scripture founds our faith. 
That is to say, God's word teaches us about reality. Right? So God's word tells us of our origin. God's word tells us very clearly that that this world, that everything in this world, that you and I as human beings, we're not some product of of a cosmic accident. Right? We're a couple of key gases in the universe that happen to get together in just the right way and, and boom, here we are. And eventually human beings kind of emerged out of that. No, the Bible teaches us about reality. It says this world, you and I as human beings, every single person has been very uniquely and very carefully, very intentionally created by God. You and me. The Bible teaches us about our sinfulness, about our need for a Savior. The Bible teaches us about Jesus, the Savior whom God has sent, the one who would die on the cross for our sins. The Bible teaches us about salvation, about this this eternal hope of glory that we have in Jesus by God's grace, even stretching into the new heavens and the new earth. The Bible teaches us about reality. It founds our faith. That's not all it does. Paul goes on to tell us here that not only does the Bible found our faith, the Bible also regulates our faith, regulates our faith. So to put it very plainly, the Bible keeps us on the right path, right? It's kind of like those rumble strips on the side of the highway, right? We can all picture that. We all know what I'm talking about here. So if we are driving along and we, we wander a little bit to the right, we hit the rumble strips, brings us back. If we wander a little bit to the left, we hit the rumble strips, brings us back, Right? The Bible regulates our faith. So if we begin to wander a little bit, maybe we're pulling a little bit to the right, and we start to think, God has abandoned me. God has abandoned me. We hit the rumble strips, and the Bible says no. God never leaves, and he never forsakes his people. Or maybe we find ourselves pulling a little bit to the left, We hit the rumble strips over there because we've begun to think that God is against me. With all this stuff happening in my life, God has got to be against me. And we hit the rumble strips and the Bible says no. God is always for his people. Always. So the Bible It keeps us on the right path. When we start to wander, when we start to wonder if what we believe is true or false, the Bible brings us right back. It regulates our faith. And then thirdly, the third task of Scripture, as Paul highlights for us here, the Bible establishes our faith. So the Bible helps us to train in righteousness. What do you need when you're training? You need a coach, right? The Bible is our coach. And it coaches us along the way of God's desire for the lives of his people to imitate Christ and to become more and more like Jesus himself. And so we have these passages like the fruit of the Spirit. It's love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, all of which we see perfectly exemplified in Jesus. We have these passages that tell us as God's people to forgive as God in Christ has forgiven you. And all of that to help us train in righteousness so that more and more we become like Jesus. Right? The Bible establishes our faith. It confirms it and it strengthens it. So these are the three tasks of Scripture. As Paul lays it out for us right here in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. And the point of all of this, Paul goes on to share that in verse 17. The point of all of this is so that God's people might be equipped for every good work. And that, especially 
in the midst of a world that is filled with such godlessness. You know, and Paul talks about that at the very beginning of our text, doesn't he? In the first few verses of chapter 3. And maybe you, like me, when we hear that we think, wow, was Paul talking about the first century or was he talking about the 21st century, right? Because here we live in this, in this environment among people who are lovers of self, lovers of money. They're proud, they're arrogant, they're abusive, disobedient to their parents, they're ungrateful, unholy, they're heartless, they're unappeasable, they're slanderous, they have no self-control, they're brutal, they don't love good, they're treacherous, they're reckless, they're swollen with conceit, they're lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. As true as that was in Paul's day, it's true today. And in the midst of such a world, the Bible, God's glorious gift, it is the only thing that can found our faith, the only thing that can regulate our faith, the only thing that can establish our faith so that you and I, we can be equipped for every good work so that you and I, can be lights in the darkness so that you and I, as God's people, we can bear witness to the gospel. So, what's your idea of Scripture? Now, I hope that we've all come to see the Bible for what it really is. It is the divinely inspired Word of God given to us that our faith might be founded, regulated, and established so that we can serve the living God. Now in that is truly how you understand the Bible. Then it almost goes without saying, but I'm going to say it anyway. You and I, we must take the Bible seriously. It has to be a priority in our lives on a regular basis. We need to read it, we need to study it. We need to ponder it. We need to meditate on it. We need to memorize it. Not one Bible in our household should be used merely for decoration or a book stop or off gathering dust somewhere in a corner. The Bible has to take center stage in our lives. It has to. We must take the Bible seriously. So here's a question for everybody. I don't care who you are. I, I don't care how young you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care where you fall in the range of, uh, of society. I don't care how highly educated you are or how lowly educated you are. I don't care how much money you make or don't make. Here's a question for you. How seriously do you take the Bible? Don't answer too quickly. Be honest with yourself. Is the Bible a significant part of your daily life? If it's not, if it's not at all or if it's not where it should be, then I would invite you, I would encourage you, I would even challenge you to do what you need to do to make it that way. And maybe you'll say to me, well, well Pastor, I, I hear what you're saying, 
you know, but I, I just can't read the Bible. You know, I, the, the language in the NIV or the ESV, it just doesn't resonate with me. Go get a different translation. There's many of them out there. There's going to be one translation out there that is going to resonate with you. Go get a different translation. You say, well, I've done that, but you know, here I've got this book, and look how big it is. I don't even know what to do with it. I don't even know where to start. Go get a reading plan. Go type it into your, your search, you know, reading plans for the Bible. Say, hey, Google, get me a reading plan. There's a whole bunch out there. It can take you from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22, chunks at a time. It can jump around a little bit. It can go chronological. There's a reading plan for you. You say, okay, yeah, yeah, but you know what? I still don't understand what I'm reading. Well, make sure either you have a good study Bible or pair it with a devotional, right? Something that's tied to Scripture. Maybe something even as simple as the Today devotional that's back in our narthex every single week. But whatever you decide to do to make the Bible a much more significant part of your day-to-day -day life, to borrow Nike's advertising slogan, just do it. Just do it. You will not regret it. And God will bless you for it. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to dig in just a, a little bit deeper on this topic of the Bible. And we are so grateful for the Apostle Paul and so grateful for the words you gave to him to say to us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and it's profitable, it is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that we might be equipped, we might be ready to serve you to be lights in this darkness and to bear witness to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, for many of us, we have to admit that we don't take the Bible as seriously as we should, that it's not a part of our regular, even daily living. And Father, we pray, if, if that's us today, that you would truly have spoken to us, that we truly have a renewed awareness of how important your word is in our lives. And that we would make some changes in our lives, that we would make some decisions, that we would do some things that would help us more and more to make your word so much more a part of us. Father, we are so thankful, so blessed by the Bible. And so, God, we pray that today we might know beyond a shadow of a doubt of your desire for us as your people when it comes to your word, that we would hear and we would be ready to respond, that your Spirit's power would enable that. We thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, would you rise if you could?
Well, as we go into God's world to declare God's truth, we go with his parting blessing. Receive that blessing now. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and grant you his peace. Amen.